I'm assuming that, except for the deaf and college folks, nobody knows what linguistics is. Okay, so uh, let me begin by saying that uh, the word linguistics is almost like human studies. It's a huge spread of different kinds of things. And quite often, people who call themselves linguists may not understand each other, depending upon what branch of linguistics they study. And also, quite often, people who are different kinds of linguistics hate each other. Which is... <laughs> yeah. Um, so, what I'm going to do is to talk about the kind of linguistics that I have been... Uh, I, I was trained in, so to speak. Uh, there are other, many other kinds of linguistics. Uh, and that kind of linguistics is interested in studying the structure of language, not the other kinds of things. So, uh, okay. So this is a crucial part for animals like us. And by structure, um, what I mean is uh, configuration. Uh, of parts. So if you have a human hand, you can say that it consists of three pieces. If you're thinking about finger, it consists of three pieces. And then you also have something about their relations. How the parts are put together and what their relations are uh, among themselves and to the whole. That's what we mean by structure. And this is important because if you're used to protein structure, uh, it can refer to shape rather than what I meant as structure, and I've had serious difficulties talking to people who do structural biology. We don't understand each other. Okay, um, now let me give you some examples of what I mean by structure. So let's take a word like raisins. Um, raisins, or any word or sentence, for example, in, in language has a pronunciation part. And reasons I can represent the pronunciation, like this, there's a R sound, and there's an A sound, there's a Z sound, an E sound, an N sound, and Z sound. So this is, I'm representing the pronunciation. And the pronunciation part has a certain structure. So you could say it consists of two syllables, re and zins, and these two form the word. That's, and the things that I call syllables have some kind of internal structure, I won't go into that. Uh, and also these, these things, the individual sounds, have also some kind of internal structure. But this is, this is kind of beginning of structure at the level of pronunciation, and people call it phonology. Phonology is a study of the structure of sounds, or the pronunciation. Then there is another kind of structure which you might call syntax. And by syntax I mean some kind of abstract level of structure. And what this would be is, let's say, uh, this will be raisin and s. Okay, that's a word. So okay, this is one unit, that is one unit. Notice that the way I divided up the things into units are different. Um, and yet another kind of structure. And you can say this, uh, I'm going to just represent it kind of like that. That thingy that we call raising. And uh, then there is another unit, it's called more than one. And these two are put together. And this is uh, what we mean by semantics. The semantics is the study of the structure of meanings. Um, <clears throat> so these are, these, these are the three, uh, three, broadly speaking, three dimensions of structure, or three parameters of structure. And you can see that the, these structures are different. And this is the structure that mediates between the, the expression, the form, and its function. For Aristotle, we've been talking about uh, this. He would have said this is the form, 
and this is the function. And mediating between form and function is this abstract thingy that we call syntax. Sometimes people think of syntax as word order. No, it's word order is only one of the components of this. There is also many other things. We'll talk about those. Um, <clears throat> So these are the, the dimensions of structure. Uh, you could also, instead of saying dimensions, we could also think about planes of structure. So in a certain sense, you can say there is a single entity, right, and various things there. And you can imagine that as being, you know, for example, suppose I put this, uh, there is structure along this plane and structure along this plane, structure along this plane, and so on. That's one way of imagining it. And these structures along these different planes are interconnected. So there are laws governing this, there are laws governing this, and laws governing this. These are, laws are not the same. And then there are also laws governing the relations between these dimensions. Um, and people refer to them as uh, people refer to them as formation rules. Formation rules are the laws governing each dimension, how things are put together in each of these. Uh, and when linguists use the word rule or constraint, they mean the same thing as law. So I might use any of those words. Uh, linguists don't use the word law for some historical reason I don't understand. But they mean the same thing. One of the reasons is because when linguistics, uh, the kind of linguistics that I described started in 1957. There's a very specific time when it originated, unless you say it originated with Parni. Uh, they started, they were thinking about laws as algorithms, procedures to create structure. And for a long time, in fact, the whole of theoretical linguistics was in terms of those procedures, mechanical procedures to create structure. Around the uh, 80s, people started saying, why do we need rules? Why don't we have these constraints? You state the relations within structural units. So they started using the word constraint. But whether you say rule or constraint from a sort of slightly distant perspective, it is irrelevant. Linguists still argue heatedly about whether they should use rules or constraints. But for an outsider, that's a meaningless discussion. And it's very hard, actually, to find real evidence to argue for one or the other. I used to belong to, at some point in the 80s, I belonged to this religion and argued heatedly for abandoning rules in terms of constraints. Uh, and then I found evidence that quite didn't fit. Uh, my religion, and was very disappointed. But nobody actually pays attention to such things because if you find counter evidence, sometimes what happens is you try to ignore it so that you can survive. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it happens in every <laughs> every science. Okay, um, and as far as I know, that problem has not been settled. Okay, so we have these formation rules and we have these correspondence rules. Formation rule, as I said, are the internal structure in each dimension. And uh, correspondence is things that connect different structures. So there is a structure of meaning and there is a structure of syntax. So what is the relation between those two? There is a structure of uh, sounds and the structure of syntax. What is the relation between these two? What is the relation between these two? Okay. In addition to these, uh, dimensions of structure. We also have uh, levels or hierarchies of structure. And by hierarchies, I mean uh, very small and slightly larger and larger and so on. It's kind of like saying you have molecules and then you have cells and then you have the organism, that kind of stuff. So um, let's try to take something like uh, he. Uh, re read 
the hook, and you have these pieces. Oops. And then you find that these are words, and those words form a sentence. And within that you have these pieces. So these are internal to words, and this happens to be a word, but this is not a word. This happens to be a word, but this is not a word. So if you say something like unhappiness, that's a piece, this is a piece, that's a piece. There are three pieces, only one of which can exist as a word. And these guys people call morphemes. And then you have words, and then you, have, you can say sentence. And then things larger than sentence. So in unhappiness, like, what do you mean by word here? What do I mean by word? Huh. I don't know exactly what a word is unless I give you a six hour lecture on word. Um, because, why don't we say we all know what it means? One way of talking about this is that in English a word is that which is separated by spaces. Um, that's one. But another way of thinking about it is to say, suppose I, I give you a Malayalam word or a Hindi word or something like that and say, what is that in English? You will, you will say, oh, it means happy. Or it means, you will say, it means unhappiness. Right? But you will not say it means un. You will not say it means ness. You will not say it means we. You will not say it means z or s. Right? That is a kind of intuition of the idea of word. Uh, by and large, when we begin a course in linguistics, we assume that there are things like words and things like sentences. We don't question it. We take it for granted. And then we begin the whole structure on the basis of these two assumptions. We will, of course, argue why this is necessary. And then maybe after about a couple of years, we'll go back to this question, do we need words in language structure? What is a word? But you can't understand that question until we have done you know, at least one year of linguistics. So let's, let's, you know, it's kind of like asking the question, what's a species? Okay, it's not a question that you would expect uh, to be answered at the beginning of biology, maybe months later. So this is a complicated thing. Uh, Tara, my wife, wrote a whole paper on called Wordhood in linguistics. And then she discovered that the notion word consists of many different ideas. They are kind of conflated together. So she called them semantic word, phonological word, functional word, categorical word, and so on. So I wouldn't go into any of those. Let's assume that we all know what it means. So this, the thing that you said in English doesn't work for all languages. But words are separated by space. Yeah, that, exactly. That's why I couldn't, that that I couldn't answer the question. That's why. Right. Yeah. So in Urdu, for example, mm. so if it is something like happiness, happiness mm. are separating. I see, okay. Not joined. But maybe, you know, what, what, say that again? So, uh, Urdu or even Hindi, mm. okay, you know, things like K, ah. separately. Okay, yeah, Th those are the difficult cases. Ah. They are words according to one, in one of these dimensions, but they are not words in some other dimension. Ah. So that is why it is necessary to tease, tease apart these different concepts of word. Yeah, absolutely. So if you say Ramne, for example, uh -huh. is Ramne a single word or two words? Uh -huh. Well, the answer is it is one word according to yeah, some, and you know, not so in. The other thing is a morpheme, right? It's a morpheme, morpheme. yeah. Uh -huh. Morphemes are slightly better than words. Okay, okay. It's easier to kind of have a hand on, though not quite, but much better than words. So I'm, I'm actually glossing over a whole bunch of difficulties when I do this stuff. <clears throat> but that's okay, you know, when you begin, you have to begin with some kind of broad approximations. So these are the kinds of levels or hierarchies that I'm talking about. So there are different levels of structure, there are different dimensions of structure. Each of these has these three dimensions of uh, pronunciation, the abstract stuff, and meaning at all these levels. Now, uh, notice that these guys 
this has a meaning, right? Namely, more than one. That single sound, z. But this sound doesn't have a meaning. 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 So these are a few rare cases where one sound has a meaning. Meaning comes in only when you have a collection of sounds. So one possible way of thinking about genes is that genes are like this. Genes acquire meanings or functions only in when they function, when they come together as collections of genes. And then you have all these peculiar things happening here, you will find, I'm pretty sure, in the relation between uh, the molecular level structure and the phenotypic level of structure. The relation between them is extremely indirect, not one to one, but many to many. So one of the reasons why I brought this up is to explore the possibility, many of you are biologists, or at least have done lots of biology, even if you are not biologists. Uh, and the view of structure that comes here, it is possible that it sheds light on the relation between genes and phenotypical structures as well. I'll just say this and then proceed, and we can look at it as we proceed. Um, okay. Now, I, I roughly said meaning and study of meaning is semantics. But there are different aspects of meaning. And many of these aspects, linguists of my persuasion will be not interested in. So, for example, there's a kind of meanings which are associated with, associated with poetry. Uh, the people who study structural meanings of this kind will say that is outside of our domain. We can't deal with that and we don't want to deal with it. So, if you say something like uh, April is the cruelest month, and the, at, at the literal level, what does it mean to say month is cruel? Okay. And the linguist, uh, linguists of this type will say that's an ill-formed, semantically whatever ill-formed thing. And poets kind of somehow assign meanings to semantically deviant sentences. But there is a branch of linguistics called stylistics, and they study things of this kind. We don't. Well, when I say we don't, I also kind of occasionally move over to the other camp, but now I'm wearing the hat of a... <laughs> of a linguist, so I said we don't study those things. I do, actually. Um, another aspect of meaning that we do not look at is the distinction between uh, two kinds of meaning. One is what you might call grammatical meanings. Uh, and the other is um, uh, what it refers to in terms of the world. This is this is the part that is important for the work that we shall explain. So let me explain that a little bit. Suppose you take the word red, and I ask you, what does it mean? You will have to point to the word and say that color, whatever it is. So you have to say something about wavelength and intensity and stuff like that. It's easier to say that thing is red and this other thing is not red. So you have to point to something in the world, some concept. But once you know what red means, you know what redden means. Okay, so when you say her cheeks reddened, it means simply turn into red color, whatever. Uh, to, if I ask you what is length, you will have to point to some entity, some property of the world. But when, when you say lengthen, uh, then if you know the meaning of length, we can figure out the meaning of length. Like, same thing applied to black, black and, and so on. Sad. Sad is simply a reference to the world, but when you say sadden, there is something that is expressed by that thing. 
this is a kind of morpheme that is part of the structure of the language. So this is structural or um, grammatical meaning. And this is not structural, this is simply word, part of our word knowledge. Um, and if you look at the kinds of things which are expressed by the structure of language, we find that it's a very small uh, type of things. And you can say these are the only kinds of things that you can express in terms of uh, language structure. So can I uh, when you say this word, word language, uh, you mean they are nouns, right? Basically, uh, you, do you do you mean that do you mean that they are uh, nouns and these ens actually make you a yeah, there, there is the, the it changes a uh, noun into a verb. verb. It so changes an adjective into a verb. So but that that is in, in here. Okay, I, okay. Right. So does verb knowledge uh, refers to that? I mean, mean that they are, they are no, no. Yeah. Nouns and verbs nouns. and adjectives are all part of structure. Okay. Right. Uh, but the distinction between black and red mm. is part of word knowledge. It is not structurally expressed. It's simply okay. an arbitrary thing. What he wants to ask is whether mm. only nouns come under word knowledge? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Nouns and verbs and everything. Okay. So take, take something like decentralize. Okay, there's something about center. If I ask you what is center, you have to point to the world, some area and the mid point of that. But what does D mean? That's structurally encoded meaning. What is eyes? Eyes means convert something into a process. Okay. These are the structurally expressed meanings. So in raisins, for example, this means more than one. Some languages can express the distinction between one and more than one. Others will express the meaning one and two and more than two. But as far as we know, there is no language that expresses, structurally expresses one, two, three, four, and more than four, it's one. Okay, that is simply impossible. That's a, one of the universals of this part of meaning. There is no, no language that expresses color distinctions in terms of structure. Number, yes, but not color distinctions. So only a certain, certain small subset of meanings can be expressed in terms of structure. So we are interested in studying those meanings. What are the meanings that structure can express? Like um, word knowledge, it, they, it could also be more nuanced, like for example, the word like misogyny. Yeah. So it's deriving meaning from subparts, even though you actually. Yeah, it, it's become, people would say it has become opaque. So okay. even though parts have meanings, the meaning of the word is not compositional. There are many cases like that. For example, blackbird, mm. right, is not necessarily a bird that is black. Butterfly is not a fly that is made out of butter. Right. Strawberry is not berry that I was made of. These are cases where there are these two pieces, but the meanings have become muddled, muddy, whatever. And people say these are opaque. Opaque in the sense you cannot derive the meaning of the whole from the meanings of the parts. But misogyny you can. Yeah. So then, uh, I, I, you can in the sense of etymology. Yes but not in the sense of people's actual consciousness. Mm 